All right. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you. Hey, Shannon. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Now, um, if you haven't heard Rachel's story, guys, it's amazing. Um, you're best known for retiring at the age of 27 and living off of passive income. I mean, that's an, an amazing accomplishment, but let's go back to tell me about, you know, who Rachel is and, and kind of how you came into learning about money. And then, and then let's talk about how you achieve that. Absolutely. So first and foremost, I'm a total finance nerd and proud of it. And I still am today. So if I kind of go back to where this whole personal finance obsession began, it was definitely in middle school. I came across this book called the Molly Fool's Guide for Teens, How to Have More Money Than Your Parents Ever Dreamed Of. And I was like, that sounds cool. Um, because what you have to know about where I grew up is I grew up in a really wealthy county in Kentucky. And by no means was my family struggling or like living in poverty, but my parents were living paycheck to paycheck. Money was always a stressor in our family and the kids in my high school, just to give you some context, a lot of them, when they turned 16, got brand new BMWs. And that was kind of the bubble that I grew up in. My family, on the other hand, was not even going out to eat at restaurants, let alone going on family trips. So I remember always feeling like we were poor in comparison. You know, I never had the same things that my friends had. And at a young age, I felt like I didn't fit in. And that's not the way you want to feel in middle school and in high school. So that's where a lot of my early on motivation and desire to achieve financial independence and learn all I could about managing money came from was just from where I grew up and being in that stressful environment. Yeah. And I think that a lot of folks don't think that money mindset is just a struggle for those who didn't have money growing up or, or weren't able to achieve certain things growing up or something, you know, around their upbringing and their parents too. And it's, everyone struggles with money mindset issues. Everyone kind of has this comparison, right? And, and we all have these other things that come up while we're growing up around money and different messages, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. And what's interesting is the money struggles never go away. So now that we're financially independent, we have a lot of money. It's like, it's never a problem in terms of not having enough money, but the money struggles just become different. And there's still a lot that I struggle with in terms of mindset. Cause a lot of this scarcity mindset that I had growing up, it's hard for me to get rid of that now and to overcome that. And I've certainly made a lot of progress, but it's, it's just, it's hard for me to kind of grow out of that. Yeah. It is not an overnight fix. It, it's not like no. you, hip, you can't hypnotize yourself out of it. You can't like take a pill. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to like alleviate that money mindset. It, it, it takes work. It really does. Yeah. And I make a lot of mistakes. You know, my biggest mistake just because of the way I grew up is being too cheap. And when you take anything to the extreme, it's not good. So, you know, a lot of people overspend and they're spending more than they make. And, and so that's not good, but then you can take frugality to the extreme as well. And that's what I did. And I've made a lot of mistakes where I was too cheap and that can end up costing you a lot more money in the long run. So th those are the kinds of things that I'm still working on overcoming. Yeah. I think we all are. I, th I, th I don't think anyone really nails it. I think everyone's no. got their own. <laughs> Yeah. Everyone's got their own version of this going on. And, and I'm, I'm thank you for making it known that even though you've achieved great financial success, you know, that's still something that, that sits there. And I think that that's so true for everyone, including myself. Um, so tell me a bit about your entrepreneurial journey and your, you know, your, how you got to this achievement of retiring at 27. I mean, tell us about how you went from sort of those struggles you're talking about in middle school and, and, how you turned into what you are now. Yeah. I, I read rich dad, poor dad in high school. And I feel like for everyone, that's always a light bulb book. Like that's the first thing that they read. And then the, it turns them onto real estate investing, which was definitely the case for me. So I knew that real estate investing was going to be a part of my journey at some point. That's how I was going to achieve financial independence. Um, it took me a long time to figure out how to do that, but I still was able to start by the time I was 24. So just kind of at a high level, 2017 is the year that my husband and I started creating passive income streams. Before that, we didn't have anything else going for us financially besides just our full-time jobs. And I always tell people, because I get this question a lot, since we scaled so quickly in terms of our real estate portfolio, I always clarify, I'm not a trust fund baby. And I never made six figures from my job or career. I was making $36,000 after college my next job after that, I was making 32 grand. My next job after that, I was making 42 grand. 
So by no means was I making some enormous salary and had that as an advantage. I had other advantages, but that was not one of them. So um, we started in 2017. We invested in our first rental property. It was a duplex in Louisville, Kentucky. And later that year, I self-published my first book, Money Honey. So we had these two passive income streams, rental income and royalty income. And we focused on growing those as much as we possibly could over the next couple of years. So fast forward to 2019, I was 27 at the time. And that is when I, when I was able to quit my job and we were becoming fully financially independent by then. We grew our passive income streams to 10 or 15 grand by then. And um, that's kind of the timeline and how quickly everything happened. And since then we've grown them even more, but that is, that's the point that we became financially independent. That's, that's amazing. So congratulations again for being able to accomplish that. And tell me a bit about, um, we just talked about the mindset shifts, right? Tell me about what had to shift for you and maybe where some of the obstacles were on that journey, uh, to get to that point, because I'm imagining it wasn't super easy. No, it was not easy. (laughs) And it's, it's interesting to look back or for the others to look at my journey and say, wow, that just happened so quick and easily and fast for her. But gosh, I mean, those were the most challenging and difficult years of my life. And looking back on it, I don't, I don't know how we did it. I mean, in those years from 2017 to 2019, we were both working full-time. So 40 to 50 hour weeks, we were acquiring rental properties and managing tenants on the weekends. And I was writing books in the evenings. So we were both working 80 hour weeks for two years nonstop. And we didn't really have much of a social life. We weren't spending money or traveling a ton or going out on the weekends. It, we were just hustling and grinding and it was very, very difficult. So there's a lot of challenges and a lot of mistakes made. So I'm glad that you're asking these questions. One of them was the fear part of it. Um, a lot of first-time investors, when they go to get that first rental property, it's a very, very scary thing and frustrating and discouraging thing. We looked for that first duplex for nine whole months and we made offers on other properties. We had an accepted contract on another property that fell through. And there was definitely a point that we could have turned to each other and said, you know what, this just isn't meant for us. Sure. We see other people having success with this, but clearly, you know, we've tried, we've done everything and it's just not meant to be. We totally could have done that because we were doing everything, all the right things. And we just, we couldn't find anything, but you have to be patient finding that first rental. You have to not settle because one thing that you can tend to do is just settle for something that's less good than what it should be in terms of investment property and the numbers and everything. Um, And I'm glad we just held out and we kept going because we found that duplex. And to this day, it's one of the best deals we we have ever done. So that was discouraging. And then another thing that really caught me by surprise was just some of the mental health struggles that I dealt with. And I like to talk about this specifically because there's such a stigma around mental health. So I like to be just open and transparent around it. But it was at the end of 2018 and we just had too much on our plates. And I didn't recognize this at the time because this was the first time I had dealt with mental health. But what started as stress and overwhelm turned into anxiety, which turned into depression. And neither me or my husband were equipped to deal with this. I didn't know what I was going through. I didn't know I was depressed. I just knew something's wrong with me. I don't feel like myself. And I don't know if I'll ever feel like myself again. And it was definitely the most like terrifying thing I've ever gone through. Um, and I, I share it because I didn't ha- I wasn't taking care of myself and I wasn't prioritizing my mental health. I didn't have any boundaries. I was working way too much. I wasn't exercising or meditating or doing journaling or affirmations or gratitude. I say all these things cause it, they're all from the book, the miracle morning. Have you read the miracle morning by Hal Elrod? I have not, but I've heard of it and I heard it's wonderful. So it's I've- so good. Yeah. yeah. Um, I say those things because a couple of things helped me to overcome my depression, which was one, going to therapy and two, reading that book, The Miracle Morning, and just having a morning routine and and a way to start the day intentionally. Because a lot of us just roll over, we look at our phone, we're immediately inundated with emails and texts, and we just start thinking about everything we have to get done. And it's like, wait a second, let's take a moment to breathe and rest and be grateful for the fact that we woke up and that we're breathing and 
start our day with intentional positivity. And once I started doing that every morning, it really, really helped me overcome the depression. Um, but it was just definitely a challenging time. I think it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners go through and it's something we don't talk about enough. So I share, I'm grateful that I went through it because now I can deal with those a lot better going forward. But at the time it was definitely one of the worst things that I've ever experienced. Yeah. And I appreciate you sharing that and, and being honest and vulnerable about that, because I feel like in this day and age, especially online, you're getting the highlight reel. You're seeing the, the successes, the milestones, and not so much the struggles or the, you know, the admission of when people are just having a hard time getting through it, or really the hours that are being worked to generate the results that you're seeing. And I think that when you actually look beneath the surface of like an iceberg, right? It's all this stuff is going on underneath. You see these two successful books, you know, you're published, you, you've got the real estate properties, but like, what are you putting in to make that happen? And I think we have to have a little grace with ourselves and with each other, knowing that that's what's going on under the surface. So I think it's so important to be talking about that actively. And, and thanks again for sharing it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking me. It's important we talk about these things. Absolutely. So if you guys can relate as entrepreneurs, we're starting businesses, we're hustling, we're doing all the things. And there's so much pressure to do everything, especially when you're by yourself or just with your spouse or just with, you know, a family member that you have to understand, ask for help, ask for help. And that could be asking for help from resources like Rachel did with the book or from each other and being open and honest about that. So it, I cannot say emphasize that enough. Thank you. Um, so speaking of that too, let's talk for a second about how you became so passionate about, uh, financial education. And I know you've read rich dad, poor dad, which is a fantastic book by Robert Kiyosaki. And, you know, how did that kind of, uh, come to develop your interest in not only your own financial well being, but that of other people? Yeah, for sure. I mean, growing up the way I did in that wealthy county and ha having this thing where I was comparing myself to others. And so that was where the initial motivation came from. But I also realized looking around, and I realized this sometime maybe in high school, that we are in a financial education crisis. At no point in our lives are we taught how to manage our money. And then we're left as young adults to try to figure it all out on our own. So it's no wonder that so many people come to me and they're dealing with guilt and shame and embarrassment when it comes to their money, which that in and of itself is a shame because it's not our fault. We weren't given the resources we need to succeed. So I began to recognize that and just see like, wow, there are so many adults and people that are twice my age that are broke and up to their eyeballs in debt. And it's not even necessarily their fault because we are just not taught these things. It's, it's just such a disappointment to me. <laughs> and so I was like, I want to do something to help. So I initially became a financial advisor after college, which wasn't the right fit for me because I'm not a salesperson. Um, I can force myself to be really good at sales and I, and I can be, but I'm an introvert. So having to like turn on the extroverted sales charm. It was just very mentally and emotionally draining. So I didn't last very long doing that, but the desire and the drive to help people with their money never went away. It was just about, there has to be another way I can do this. And it didn't come to me for a few more years, but then I finally came up with the idea of writing a book. So in terms of writing money, honey, by then all of my family and friends were coming to me and asking me for financial advice which is great. That is what I love to do. And I had this aha moment because I was, I was wondering, you know, why aren't they reading books on their own? Like I did, why aren't they learning on their own? And then I realized, oh yeah, it's because personal finance is boring, right? For most people it's overwhelming. It's intimidating. It's complex. No wonder people don't like to learn about it. So I thought to myself, how can I make this topic sassy and fun and simple? And that's where the idea for Money Honey came from. So I sat down, I started writing the book. Um, it was a passion project. It was a lot of fun for me. And that's really how I started writing the book. And that's where my business was born. I, I love it. And what drew me the most to you when I, when I was looking at your, your profile and I was looking at your website was um, I, I kind of fell in love with your whole brand when I saw the name of your course. 
so, so Rachel has a course called get your financial shit together. And even better, <laughs> the S is a dollar sign. And I was like, okay, this is a woman after my own heart. I love this thing. I love it. Because those of you who listen, anyone who knows me on Instagram, you guys know, I love to make this stuff funny. I love to make like accounting, right? Personal finance, accounting, they're cousins and they're both boring. Mm-hmm. And yeah. nobody likes to hear us lecture. No one likes to hear us talk, which is what <laughs> this whole podcast is really about is bringing you this education in a digestible way. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more. It's why I created this whole thing. Right. So, you know, preaching to the choir over here, um, yes. financial education is, is insanely valuable, but I think that, uh, and tell me if you agree, Rachel, that we don't understand how valuable it is until we realize that, you know, it's quote unquote too late or mm. it's, if we find out the hard way, how valuable it is. Totally. Yes. It's once we're paycheck to paycheck or we miss a bill or we get a late payment, there's normally just a, almost a rock bottom or a moment where we have to have this reality check and it's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Or I don't even know what I'm doing. All I know is my financial situation is not good. And it's almost this moment of panic, realizing you don't know anything and how the heck do you even start? And that's where most of my people come from. And it's, it's just so frustrating that they even have to feel that way. I mean, that's, that is a fault of our public education system, but that's why you and I are here doing what we're doing. So kudos to you as well. Thank you. Yeah. And and that's why it's so important to find other like-minded people that are doing this type of thing and work together to, to help make a change because change is not coming unless we start it, right? When it mm-hmm. comes to financial education, especially um, to those who don't receive it in, in any type of formal education. Um, it's just so insanely important. So as I mentioned, you have the course, it's called Get Your Financial Shit Together and it's available on your website still, I believe. Uh, I love anything that just de-escalates the topic of money into something like that, where you're, it, it just makes it so much more approachable. Uh, tell us about what that course does and how it makes these topics approachable, easy to understand and, and what you include in that. Yeah. Thank you. It's a really fun course. I have had hundreds and hundreds of students go through it and it's one of my favorite things. So here's, here's the realization I had is there was a lot of people reading my book and my book is, is popular on Amazon, but there's this phrase, knowledge is power, right? And that's true in some ways, but it's also not true because knowledge is only power if you do something with it, if you take action on it. You can know everything in the, if if knowledge was power, then, I mean, we would, I feel like a lot of us would be a lot richer than we are because a lot of us know inherently the things we should be doing, right? We know we should be paying off our credit cards. We know we should be spending less money and, and have a budget. We know we should invest in the stock market. So why aren't we doing it? It's just because in real life, having self-discipline is a really hard thing to have. So once I realized that and realized that people need more hands-on help besides just reading a book, that's when I decided, you know, I could really create a program that can hold people accountable, give them the support and the structure they need to actually take action on what they're learning. So that's what the course is for. It's designed for people who maybe are living paycheck to paycheck, people who are just starting out or who have read Money, Honey, and want to implement what they've learned. And the goal is to just so that they have cash on hand to do the things they love. You know, they can get their bills paid. They're not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. They can start investing for their future and just be in a much healthier place with their money where it gives them relief and joy instead of stress and overwhelm. 100% agree. I love that mission. And I love that you have something available to help people do that. Uh, And so there's the personal finance side of what you do, right? Let's talk about what you specialize in educating folks on. So there's personal finance, um, a lot of the real estate investing, right? And uh, how to essentially do what you did and retire early, right? So let's talk about that for a second. When we look at retiring early, I think there's actually a stigma out there right now on what are you gonna do if you retire early? Why would you wanna retire early? And uh, yeah. I see you smiling at that too, going, yeah, tell us, tell us why, tell us your reaction to those types of statements that you probably hear all the time. Yeah, you're right. And I almost don't even want to use the word retired anymore because I use the words retired and financially independent interchangeably. 
So to me, being retired has never been about not working anymore, but I think a lot of people see it that way. And that's where the confusion comes from. So if, if we're defining retirement as not working anymore, then I would agree. I wouldn't want to retire either. Cause I get bored. I get bored too easily. I wish I could go and do the beach thing or golf for the rest of my life. Like some people can, I just get bored. Honestly, I'm jealous. I, I have this obsession with creating and building things. So to me, being retired is about working when, if, and where. So working when, where, and if I want. Um, that's what I think is attractive about it. And I will caution people, don't be so caught up on the getting away from something, you know, quitting the job, escaping the rat race that you don't think about what you're moving towards because that's a mistake a lot of early retirees make you're going to be freeing up a lot of time if you retire early and you quit your job. And if you haven't thought through how you're going to spend that time, that transition will be incredibly difficult. Because if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, you have decades ahead of you. A lot of the times giving up your career can be a a sense, you can lose your sense of identity or your sense of purpose or fulfillment. So you need to have something else to fill that time in with, whether it's volunteering or traveling or having a project or starting a business there needs to be something. So I definitely encourage you to think about that from the, from the very beginning. Yeah. I think that's so important. I think retirement people just associate with laying in a pool in Florida and, yeah. or playing golf. And it's, it's not, when you look at the term, you know, and retire, it has tired in it. You know? Yeah, true. <laughs> it just sounds like, Oh, doing nothing. And I know that for you, that couldn't be further from the truth. I know you're not exactly doing nothing. Um, much like me, I can't sit still either, or like (laughs) enjoy relaxing on the beach without doing something. So yeah, uh, we're working. I mean, I think I went from working 80 hours a week to 30 hours a week. So I feel like I hardly work, even though to some people that's still a lot, we travel a lot, we work out a lot and we hike a lot. And that's pretty much all we do now. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. I I love it. That's just called living. It's just living on your terms. And I just, I love that. Um, so let's talk for a second about, you know, we talk about retiring early. We talked about how the real estate investing was really your gateway to allowing you to have that flexibility, to be able to live and work on your terms, we'll say. Uh, let's talk about if, if folks want to get into real estate investing, right? There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of so-called gurus, right, on social talking about this. Uh, there's a lot of resources available, you know how can they help make sense of all this stuff? And are there tools out there to help them and and tell us if you have anything to help them as well? Yes. Real estate investing is such an amazing pathway to early retirement. I think anything you can do where you're creating passive income is really, really smart. And so let me just back up. I'll define what I think passive income means. Passive income to me is money that is earned with little to no ongoing effort. Is it a get rich quick scheme? No, absolutely not. And I think the word passive income is misused a lot now. So don't get it mixed up. It takes a lot of time and or money to create a passive income stream. But once you have it created and you have it going, it can be pretty hands-off. Most passive income streams require a few hours a month or a couple hours a week to maintain. So it's not 100% passive, but it's a lot more passive than a nine to five job. So I think anything you can do where you're creating passive income will really help you achieve early retirement. Real estate investing is one of my favorites ways to achieve early retirement because it's not just about passive income. There's actually four benefits. So number one, you have the passive income or the cash flow. Number two, you have equity buildup because your tenants are paying your mortgage for you over time. So after 30 years, you own a property free and clear, having only paid the down payment. That's incredible. Number three, you have tax benefits, depreciation being a big one. And then number four, this is always a bonus. You can never count on this. But number four, if it happens, is appreciation. So if the property also increases in value over time, that's another way you can build wealth. So for that reason, real estate investing has always been one of my favorite passive income streams just because it has all of these different financial benefits. Now, in terms of resources, there are, you're right, there's a lot of real estate gurus out there. It's like 
who's legit, who do you know is teaching the right stuff. Um, I'll name a few resources that I think are incredibly helpful. Bigger Pockets is one of the best resources out there. They have a website, they have a forum, they have calculators, they have books, they have a podcast. I was on their podcast earlier this year. So they are a really, really great resource. Um, another one, Paula Pant with Afford Anything. I like her stuff. She also has great real estate resources as well. And then I do too. So in my second book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement, I do have a section on real estate investing. Um, and I also have a few programs. So my rental property boot camp is actually going to be starting on January 12th. And it's a 12 week live program. Um, what I did with this, Shannon, is I asked my platform, I was like, hey, if you are trying to get invested in real estate, what's holding you back? Like, what are the biggest obstacles? They named two things. Number one, finding good deals, right? Because in the market right now, it is really hard to find a good rental property and to find a good deal. The market's crazy. And then number two, they didn't know how to analyze property. They were having a really hard time understanding whether it was a good deal or not. So my rental property bootcamp focuses on those two things. It's find and analyze rental property. And I teach it over 12 weeks live. So that's another option as well. I love that. Yeah, I would agree. I think the biggest struggle too, is when you're getting into these invest investment areas, right? It's I'm not familiar with real estate investing. How do I know if I'm walking into a good deal? How do I know if I'm not getting scammed or how do I know if this is right for me? And I'm imagining that's a huge barrier for a lot of people who are just starting out. Yeah. And finding good deals, it's so tough. And one thing I'll say is if you're looking for deals on Zillow or on the MLS, you are not going to find a good deal because that's what everyone else is doing. It's too competitive. It's too saturated. You have to go out there and consider some of these other creative ways to find off-market deals, pre-foreclosure leads, short sales, bandit signs, uh, driving for dollars. There's so many different ways. You can't just, and to put it bluntly, you can't just sit on your couch on a laptop and expect to find good deals. Like you have to get out there and do what others are not willing to do if you want to find a good investment deal. And I teach nine ways to find off market deals in my boot camp in extreme detail. So that is awesome. So, where can they find more information about your boot camp? And by the way, it's going to be in the show notes too, but uh, tell us more about how we can learn about the boot camp. Yeah, thank you. So if you go to my website, moneyhoneyrachel.com, you can see my different programs there. You can get signed up. And I appreciate you asking me about it, Shannon. That's super nice of you. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, guys, it's starting, I think, next week. Uh, so we should definitely want to get on that and, and learn more about real estate investing. And uh, what I love is that you can package that up into something that's, you know, here's all the resources available to you, you know, from a trusted person to say, Hey, go, go check these out. Cause this is what I trust and what I use. It's just insanely valuable and will save you so much time because real estate investing time makes you money. So the best thing not to waste. Um, so what I'd like to do is jump into the three rapid fire questions. I love asking every guest, which I'm, I'm looking forward to Rachel's answers. She does not know I'm going to ask these questions. And, uh, and then I'm going to, uh, surprise you guys with a special treat at the end. So let's dive in. Rachel, what is one investment that you cannot live without? Ooh, this is a great question. Um, right now, I have to say syndications Tell me is the investment. That. Yeah. Okay. My husband and I have sold a lot of our rental units this year because we have invested the money into syndications. It's a much more passive way to invest in real estate. So a syndication, let's pretend an investor finds a $10 million apartment complex and they can't buy it on their own. They can form a syndication and raise money from other investors, people like you and me. So we can invest in this syndication as an LP, a limited partner, and we're actually equity owners in this property, which means we're entitled to a share of the profits. So every month or quarter, we get a check for a share of the cash flow. And then if the property ever sells, we get a percent of the profit on sale as well. Um, it's really cool because I've never found anything that's a more passive way to invest in real estate. And you get all the benefits as if you directly own the property as well. So you still get a K-1, you still get the tax benefits of depreciation and everything. 
and you do the due diligence up front, you make the investment, and then you just literally get a check once a month or once a quarter. Now, I, what, the reason I didn't do this starting out, number one, I didn't know about them. <laughs> number two, a lot of them, you have to be an accredited investor. And then number, th and not all of them, but a lot of them. And number three, a lot of the minimum investments on these are like 50 or a hundred grand. And I didn't have that kind of money starting out. But I think with the real estate investment journey, it's always a time versus money trade-off. And when most people start out, they have more time than money. And then as you get later on in your journey, you have you might have more money than time. And that's where we are. And that's why we're starting to transition into syndications. So I would say that's the investment I cannot live without now. <laughs> Love that. Love it. What is one thing that you learned about money that turned out not to be true? Oh, wow. Um, Cause there's a lot, right? I would have, <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> I would say, and you know, it's interesting. My views and my opinions change over time. Um, Okay. I would, I would have to, there's like a couple of things I could say. I would have to go with, I used to be very, very anti-debt just from an emotional perspective, really. And I didn't like to carry debt. So I didn't want to have to take out student loans, pay for college. I made sure I paid my way through school, graduate without debt. I never wanted to take a car loan. I paid for my first used car in cash. Um, that's how I always approached it. But I, I don't agree with that now. I feel like if I was going to get a car now, I might consider getting a car loan. And here's why. If you can get a car loan at a 1% interest rate and take your 20 grand in cash and invest it into something that's earning 10 or 15 or 20%, you're actually going to make a lot more money that way. So if you're always kind of playing the interest rates off each other and you're putting your money towards the highest interest rate, whether that's an investment or a debt payoff, that's really the mathematically the wisest use of your money. So, or on the other hand, if you have a 20% credit card or you have an opportunity to invest in something where you could earn 8%, it makes more sense to pay down your 20% credit card balance. So once I started looking at things in terms of interest rates, instead of just thinking all debt is bad, that's when I started making, in my opinion, like just money decisions that could help me make my money go further. And of course, getting over the all debt is bad thing helps me become a real estate investor. I had to take out mortgages for all my rental properties. And I'm really grateful for what using debt has allowed me to do. So I think debt can be a very, very smart tool when you're using it as leverage to purchase a cash flowing asset. That's one of the smartest ways to use debt. So that has been a mindset shift that has really helped me build massive wealth in a short amount of time. I love that. And one of the analogies I use that you mentioned, you know, when you're using debt to grow with cash flowing assets was when you're looking at the interest rates, I like to say that if you're comparing, you know, if you're, if you're investing, you know, in, let's say you're investing in index funds, right? Something, something simple, but you're, you have this 20% credit, um, credit card rate of interest, and you're not paying that down. It's like walking up an escalator that's going down. Yes. You're not, you're not going anywhere. You're just, you get, you're going to keep walking and you might be going really fast, but the escalator is going faster. So you're actually not moving in space. You're, you're just really, really working hard. And I use that analogy all the time to say, are you going up the escalator <laughs> or is it moving down with you? And, and what's, what's actually going faster? And, and it's just so important to look at both of those simultaneously and not just one dimension, because I agree, there's a lot of stigma around debt that it's evil. And I think that's from a few of the financial gurus out there are preaching that, you know, all debt is bad, but yeah. <laughs> it's debt is a tool, just like anything else. It's a tool that if you know how to use it, it can be really impactful, but if you don't, it can do some damage. So thank you for bringing that up. I love that point. Yeah. Um, and I love your analogy. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, so lastly, Rachel, what makes you feel like a millionaire? Ooh, that's a good question. I, it's not, it's definitely not the car I drive or the clothes I wear or the house I live in. We're in this like old Airbnb right now. And, um, I would say though, it's not having to set an alarm 
It's being able to fly home if my friend or family needs me or if, you know, my parent is having a surgery and I want to be there. It's being able to book a ticket home, moving around some meetings, having the freedom to do that. It's being able to go to the gym every day at two or three o'clock just because that's when I want to go to the gym. Um, Not having to ever make decisions based on finances. It's never a factor in the decisions I'm making in terms of do I want to have this experiment experience? Do I want to go out to eat with friends? Do I want to go on this trip? So I would say it's, it's a lot of those things that make me feel like a millionaire. That's a great question. I love it. (laughs) So, uh, so for everyone listening, I've got a special surprise for you. So if you go on social media right now, take a snap of this podcast episode, upload it to your stories, any social media platform you use where you can tag me and you can tag Rachel, What I want you to do is share your biggest takeaway from this episode, because I know you definitely have a few, and I want you to tag us both, share your biggest takeaway, and I'm going to be picking a winner and send them a copy of Rachel's book. So they're going to get a copy. You're going to get a copy (laughs) of Money Honey sent right to you if you share your biggest takeaway. So we would love to hear from you, show Rachel some love, and thank her for being on the show for me by telling her how much you learned from her today, because that's how people like she and I get a ton of value out of these experiences. We don't even do it for the money, right? We're financial people, but like, this is what lights us up as educators. So share your biggest takeaway. Make sure you tag us on Instagram. Ideally, I know you're active on Instagram. So am I. And uh, take it away, Rachel. How can people follow along with you on your journey and learn more about what you're doing? Thank you. I appreciate that. That's amazing. The giveaway. And for the giveaway, my Instagram handle is money, honey, Rachel. And what's yours, Shannon? Mine's at Shannon K Weinstein. You guys know where to find it. It's going to be in the outro as well. (laughs) Amazing. Okay, cool. So money, honey, Rachel. And what I'd also love to do is if anyone listening would like to download my passive income starter kit, I will give that for free. So you can go to moneyhoneyrachel.com forward slash bonus to download that. And thank you so much for having me. This has been an absolute blast. I really appreciate it. Love it. Thank you for your generosity and sharing your knowledge and your resources with us. We're going to have a ton of links in the show notes, guys. Make sure you scroll down and go check those out and grab that bonus. And Rachel, thank you for so much for being on the show. And I'm hopeful we'll, we'll continue this conversation again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. All right.